All right, well, we can go ahead and get started. How's everyone doing? Good. Excellent, excellent. My name is John Swayze, and I'm a voice actor out of Houston, Texas. You know me from roles like All for One from My Hero Academia, uh, Undertaker from Black Butler, Lord Death from Soul Leader. Oh, <laughs> I love that. John, you're uh, Hohenheim. Oh, I don't know. What are they? Well, they're little. Uh, uh, if you were going to do trivia, they were uh, little prizes for trivia questions. Oh, how many things you got there? Oh, I've got enough to give everybody here one if they want. Well, let's give everybody here one first, and then we'll do a trivia question. Um, and uh, I also play Hohenheim in my uh, Full Metal Alchemist, Crocodile in One Piece. There we go, and a whole bunch of others. Um, I uh, have been doing this voice acting thing in anime for about 27 years. Uh, I started, thank you, Woo. and uh, I started in Houston, Texas, and I worked primarily at Sentai Filmworks, formerly ADV Films, um, and uh, Cru uh, Crunchimation, or whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, Funny Roll. Funny Roll, <laughs> and uh, Dallas. Um, but I'm also a director, an ADR director at Sentai, and so I really am, am I, I'm doing two shows right now at Crunchyroll. One is uh, Vinland Saga, and uh, the other one is, of course, My Hero Academia. Um, it's funny, too, because Vinland Saga, it's season two of Vinland Saga, and I directed season one at Sentai Filmworks, but uh, uh, rights for dubbing and streaming and blah, 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 all are, are, there's different rights for everything. So I know sometimes fans will say, like, I don't understand how you all did this and now it's a completely different cast and it's because the rights went to somebody else and I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, do you all know the show Kaika Yeah. Yeah. So Netflix did a version and season uh, or season one and then season two and then uh, the people that own it wanted to do a home video version but Netflix doesn't do that. So Sentai won the rights, won the, won the contract. And so he called uh, Netflix and said, hey, we're, we're doing the home video version of Kagagururi, and so we would like just to buy your dub version so we can put it onto Blu-ray. And they said, okay, sure. 24, 24 episodes, two seasons, 10,000 an episode. And we all went, what? <laughs> Dude, it doesn't even cost us a thousand to dub it ourselves. So you're talking two hundred forty thousand versus twenty four thousand. So the company that oh thank you the company that owns it said well we're not going to pay two hundred forty forget it just cast it redub or recast it redub it and so now there's two versions of Kaikagururi. So um, that's one of the reasons that you you see that kind of thing. So anyway, but uh, so I yeah I've been uh, I'm from Houston. This is my first time to Pennsylvania. Uh, for a, I said, I'm trying to think, it may be my first time to Pennsylvania. No, I've been to Pittsburgh a couple of times uh, for work, for video work. But this is my first time to Pennsylvania uh, in the anime capacity, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, anybody live here in Lancaster? Okay, well, well done. Good town. I'm sure it's all because of you, so uh, well done. Uh, you should give her an extra sticker. Uh, just because uh, you made Lancaster really beautiful. It's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous little town. I've only gotten to see a little bit of it. So can you answer me this? Now, before you get the sticker out, hang on a second. I can, <laughs> now I have a question for you. Outside my hotel, I'm on the 18th floor looking, I don't even know what direction I'm looking, but there are some like really big hills off in the distance. I, don't, I wouldn't call them mountains. Do you know what those are? Do they have a name or anything? No idea? They have a name, Well, that's close enough, right? She can get up sticker. No, that's pretty good. No, that's okay. Okay. I mean, not every range of hills or whatever has to have a name, you know? So, um, I just, I was just curious. Oh, hold on, that's my brother calling. How funny. He sent me a text and said, do not answer next phone call. And then it rang and it was him. Oh, he's leaving you a voicemail. Oh, that's very weird. 
Anyway, um, but I'm thrilled to be here. I, I love it. Uh, I'm glad the weather is beautiful. I think you know it's great. I've uh, never been to Amish country, um, so I'm, I'm very very excited about that. Um, in fact, maybe in honor of that, I should not even use the microphone. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so yeah, so I've been doing anime for 27 years. I direct full time right now. I'm. Uh, Directing, I just finished directing a show called Eminence and Shadow. And uh, if you have not seen it, if you have not heard of it, it is a wonderful, wonderful show. Um, right now, uh, Sentai is doing, um, we're doing a lot of shows in the isekai genre, uh, which is, uh, y'all familiar with isekai? So we're doing a lot of shows like that. Um, and that's really cool. We're, we're having a good time with that. But, uh, but Eminence and Shadow is really good. Um, if you don't have High Dive, I'd, I'd strongly recommend you go check it out. It's like $5 a month, but it's the streaming platform for Sentai Film. And uh, it's got a lot of great shows on it, like Eminence and Shadow. And uh, I'm currently directing a movie, uh, which is a remake of a series called The Penguin Drum. And uh, I don't, has anyone ever heard of Penguin Drum? It's, it's really, really weird. And when I say weird, it's like a hit of acid dropped a hit of acid. I mean, it is like just out there. Um, and uh, it's been a real, real fun ride though. So anyway, I enjoy doing this a lot. My uh, daughter, Olivia Swayze, is also a professional actor. She just graduated from U of H, uh, University of Houston, go Cougs. And uh, by the way, I'm gonna find something out about that. Um, but uh, uh, she is an actor. In fact, she's in Kaiku Gururi. Um, and uh, she is uh, also in, uh, she's in some stuff, but she's been a lot of stuff on her own, I, not just with me, but uh, she's been a lot of, a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I live in Houston and life is good. I direct full time at Sentai and I'm just having a blast living a dream. I, um, I'm on week number two, weekend number two of a 10 week, 10 weekend in a row run of conventions. So I'm very excited. Uh, last year I did 44. Conventions, wow. yeah, and it was exhausting <laughs> to say the least. But uh, it's been amazing, you know. When I started doing this kind of stuff, um, conventions there might be uh, two or three conventions a month somewhere. Now there's six and seven a week everywhere, and it's just it's it's amazing. I heard the, them say that this convention started in I think 2013. It's like 10 years old now, and well, it moved wow. here in 20 oh, it's old. 2013 at this hotel. Oh, okay. So it's even older than that. Um, Larry Fury over here is a, a good, good old friend of mine, and he's my handler for this weekend. He's been involved with the show before, and um, I, for a while, or, or just uh, uh, since 2012 is my first year with them. Okay, uh, but I met Larry at my very, my very first convention down in uh, Florida at a show called MetroCon, and. Uh, it's just been a, it's been a wild ride. If y'all are available uh, tomorrow night at uh, I think it's eleven o'clock or midnight or no eleven o'clock I think I'm doing a con horror stories. That is all of the weird things that have happened to me at conventions. It's not bad things about a convention. It's just stuff that's happened to me, including a story uh, that happened just last weekend. So yeah, but that's um, be tomorrow night at eleven right next door. Tomorrow night at 11, right next door. Okay, great. So, um, anyway, yeah, so that's pretty much me. I've got a dog, a wife. I should probably say I've got a wife and I also have a dog. <laughs> dog should not come first in that order. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, you've heard the term, I'm living the dream, but I'm, you know, when I started out as an actor, uh, I was. 15 years old, and I went to New York and saw a Broadway musical. It was like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing in the world. And uh, I wanted to be a Broadway actor. So uh, I made it back to New York uh, when I was 50. <laughs> so I never quite, quite got there to Broadway. Um, but I moved to Houston, started doing uh, live theater, like sketch comedy and, and stuff like that, and plays, and then started doing commercials. And that was in 1987. And I did some movies. Uh, you ever heard of a movie called Dazed and Confused? Mm -hmm. I play a, a small but pivotal role in Dazed and Confused. I'm the beer delivery guy that delivers a keg of beer to the house uh, and thwarts the whole after school party. 
So, um, but then one day in 1997, somebody said to me, you ought to get into anime. And I was like, what's anime? They said, it's Japanese animation. I said, well, I don't speak Japanese. They said, no, no, we, we dub it into English. And I said, oh, okay. So I tried it and uh, started doing stuff. And I, for a long time, didn't understand what, still didn't understand what anime was. I was like, you know, why does everyone have blue spiky hair? I don't, you know, what's the, I don't get it. Because to me, it was just another acting game, you know. Um, I was doing a lot of commercial work, a lot of film work and uh, industrial stuff. And uh, then uh, slowly but surely it started to take off. And then about three, four years into it, I started directing and now I just, all I do is full time. I don't even, I don't have time to do film and commercial and stuff anymore. I'm 24 uh, seven doing anime. So it's uh, really, it's been really cool how my career has gone. Um, and I, I know for me, and I can tell you, there's a ton of other actors like Lucy Christian or Monica Rial or Eric Vale, you know, they would just sell, tell you, they would have never, ever have imagined this is where their acting career would have led them. But we're all, all of us are just grateful and thrilled and, and want, it's wonderful to be a part of this community. So um, anyway, this is a chance to meet me, to say hello and get to know each other. Again, it's my first time here to Pennsylvania, but if you guys have any questions for me, I'd love to answer them. Um, you know, I can't give you out credit card numbers or anything like that, but if, uh, if you do have any questions about me or you know, anything, just let me know, yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen all your major roles from Crocodile to you know, Dad to Hell and I, but all for one of my far is my my favorite role. And I think he's one of the best villains of all time. Well, thank and, you. And I was hoping your voice is just so when you do. I was hoping you could actually just do like a small, like one of his lines or something like you know, with him or you know Walmart or all that. Like that. That's well, sure, I'd be glad to. So amazing. One of the, one of the things you know when you're signing autographs, you know every time I sign an autograph, I always put a quote. I don't like to just sign a name. I like to put a quote and, you know, just make it cool, you know, if I can. And, uh, but when I'm recording lines, um, cause I record in Houston and the studio's up in, actually up in Dallas. So one of the things that was great about the pandemic is that it forced us, and I say us collectively as studios and production companies, it forced us to really embrace the idea of remote recording. So, which is a great thing because, you know, it used to be we really wanted people to come into the studio or the studio wanted us to, you know, I would drive up four hours up to Dallas, record for six or seven hours and then drive four hours back. You know, that just made for a long day. And uh, I've got the red cars to prove it. So, you know, it's, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so now we do this remote recording. Well, now when I'm recording remotely, you know, I'm in the studio in Houston and I'm watching the script and watching the video, the engineers over here. And as we go through the lines, I'm always looking for like the next cool line that I can use as a quote. <laughs> so this is that line. Have you, are you caught up on the show? Uh, yeah, I haven't seen the last season yet. I watched it last season, but yeah. I'm... Okay, I, I didn't want to yeah. ruin anything. You know? But that one scene in the show, you know I'm talking about that. With you and Chris Abbott, that, well, this is, so this, what I'm talking about, this is with me and Eric, uh, Ishigaraki. Oh, okay. And, and we, we sort of morph into the, the same person. And so we recorded it. He would record his lines and I would record mine, but I would listen to what Eric did and then say it exactly like he said it. And not close. I mean, it had to be exact, you know, because it had to fit perfectly. But anyway, right before that, uh, he has a line and he goes... Finally, you are mine. Oh no, you misunderstand. You are the new me. So, that's awesome. so if you have a pop or you want to get a signed uh, print with All For One, I'm probably going to put that on there. <laughs> Unless you say, don't put that, you already said it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you've done such a range where you have the darkest villains like All for One or really um, self-sacrificing heroes like Von Hohenheim. Like, do you have a particular favorite kind of role you like to do, either heroes or villains or a great kind of character? So um, I play a lot of villains and a lot of dads. And a lot of times they're the same guy. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, and, and 
doing this, starting back in 1987 and doing this, I sort of got a reputation with both ADV, now Sendai, and Funimation, now Crunchyroll, as I, I kind of having a, a, a chameleon type voice where I can do a lot of different things, or a real heavy. What I don't have is that tropish 17 year old boy, you know, and, and, and this is just important with acting, you know, I can't, I can't sound like that without sounding fake. I mean, it just, it just doesn't, you know, resonate right. So, uh, I, I really just sort of started leaning into that, but prior to that, uh, because there just weren't that many people doing voiceover in this field, we got called on a lot to do a lot of different roles. So you might have um, uh, Todd Haberkorn might be the lead in this one show. And then I would come in and do a supporting character and then maybe a bunch of ancillary one-off type characters and that kind of thing. Nowadays, there's so many people that want to do this and that can do it and that are very good at it. Now we can actually cast a show and use everybody for a single voice, you know. Um, but before it was, you know, a lot of budgetary restraints and stuff like that. Point being is that while I've done a lot of different stuff, my favorite now is definitely in that. Any, I mean, maybe like the five or six main characters I do are the, my favorites. I mean, but definitely that older sounding, gruffer, um, you know. In fact, when I when I auditioned, do you know the show Soul Eater? Yeah. So I play Lord Death. And when I auditioned for it, I didn't know anything about the show. And I just assumed, I think I was working on uh, One Piece at the time. I was also doing My Bride as a Mermaid, where I played Gosaburo. And everything Gosaburo does is like this. Hello, it's nice to meet you! You know, it's just like everything he did was he yelled. And so I get called in to do this Lord Death character. You know, he's got a mask on, I can't see a face or anything. And I just kind of was like, well, you know, I don't really know anything about him. And I'm sure his name is Lord Death, so he's got a, I'm Lord Death, you know, that kind of thing. And so I went in an audition like that, and Zach, the director, is like, oh, 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 hold on a second. Listen to what the Japanese actor did. And that was a very, for me, that was a very important lesson that I still use today, whether I'm acting or directing. I always listen to what the Japanese actor did, because the Japanese actor, number one, the Japanese actor is the one who created the role, not me. Number two, uh, I don't want to mimic the Japanese actor, but I do want to kind of get in the same vein to make the character make sense in the English version. So I listened to the Japanese and I was like, oh, he's way up here like this. Okay, that makes more sense. You know? <laughs> and uh, so uh, while I love pushing myself, I do feel more comfortable down in the, in the range like this. That kind of thing. So, good question. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the role I know you best for is definitely Salvador Borderlands. <laughs> yeah. Salvador! Yeah! yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the question he asked, uh, you touched on something where, um, with the uh, thing with Alpha 1 and Shigaraki, where like, you, you recorded a line and then he recorded it the same way. Mm -hmm. um, there was something in Borderlands 2 where, for like a short period of time, like for like one small part of the game, each of the characters had like a voice change that made them sound like Hanson Jack. Uh, and Hanson, and, and Damon Clark, or Damon Clark? Damon Clark. Yeah, uh, he like played all, I think five, uh, Krieg wasn't out yet, uh, characters, like did voice lines for those characters. I was just wondering if uh, that was a similar process, or did he just do that like on his own? Um, I don't know. It, maybe. Or, or do you hear both voices at the same time? No, it's just. Is it, or is it just him trying to mimic what we sounded like? Uh, it's but him it's as him handsome Jack. The, it's him doing the handsome Jack voice, like as if it was the character. Okay. In, in the handsome Jack. Voice. Right. Yeah. No, that would be different. That would be uh, uh, that would be a little different. The way, also, the way that we record, uh, whether it's video games or um, or anime, uh, doing ADR, is we only record one actor at a time. 
So we never work like in a group of actors. In a lot of prelay, what they call prelay animation, where they record the, the, the audio first and then animate around it, you might have a scenario where you've got three or four or more actors in, a, in the studio doing a scene together. And um, then they'll, they, they can animate around that. But pardon me, the way we do it, it's, it's just one actor at a time. So they probably just had him do it because I don't, I don't remember having to do anything like that. Although, if I was the first one to record, I may not know that's what they were doing anyway. You know what I mean? They may have come in and, oh, yeah. so, yeah. But that was a tough role too. That was, that was probably the hardest role I ever did. Oh, really? Uh, well, I mean, I came up with a character voice, which they really loved, but um, it was one of those things, uh, you should always think about things before you actually act on them. And when they were like, so he's just kind of Russian, El Salvadorian, you know, whatever he is, is but he's big. And so I looked at him and I listened to the, you know, well, I didn't listen to the Japanese, there was no Japanese, but I, I was like looking at him and I was like, yes, he sounds like, probably has to be big, yes. And so they loved that. Well, the problem was, is that's a very hard voice to s sustain in the video game world because there's a lot of, I thought you could do it! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> After like three and a half hours, man, I was like, well, I'll see y'all next week. <laughs> you know, it just ragged my voice out, you know. Uh, that's another reason I love voices that are down here like this. That's a little easier to do. Um, but uh, he is one of my favorites. He's also the keeper and possessor and uh, of my most favorite line to ever record. But you have to come to the 18 or over panel to hear it. <laughs> so, sorry. I think that's what it is, but yeah. Well, if you do, you get a sticker. So, uh, <laughs> anybody else have a question? Oh, yes. What has it been like watching all for one for evolution through the anime so far and seeing where we first met him to where he is right now in the anime? Yeah, so watching all for one's sort of linear progress has been uh, it's been wonderful. I, I you know when I started out uh, doing him, uh, a lot of times when you go up to do a show, let's say I drove up to Dallas to do a show. And I was working with this one director for like three hours. And then a lot of times when, you, when they find out you're coming up, they really try to utilize you as best they can. So if you're directing me, what is your name? Hi. Yeah. Uh, Marissa. Marissa? Yeah. So let's say Marissa is directing me for three hours on a show. And then what is your name? Brandon. Brandon. So Brandon goes, oh, you got John coming up for three hours. Well, you know what? I've got uh, two hours I could use with him. So then I work for you for two hours. And then over here, you might go, well, you know what? I've got some small bit pieces. I can use them for an hour. And you and I kind of you kind of build up your thing. So you, you make more money. I mean, that's just all it is. But they're trying to help me. Y'all are trying to help me out by giving me more roles. So when I first started doing All for One, uh, there's, you know, I mean, I, you know, he's not in it from the get-go. You know, and especially being the villain that he is, he's you only see bits and pieces of him. So literally, I would go up to Dallas and record on this show for a couple hours, on this show for a couple hours, on that show for a couple hours, have lunch, come back and do that for a couple hours, and then I walk into Colleen's studio and she goes, "Yeah, we're doing uh, some uh, all for one from uh, uh, my hero," and I was just like, "Okay, well, I don't even know what that is." So all right, whatever. <laughs> We, you did it last time you were here. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 sure. And it would be like, and recording. Very well, then. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for coming in, man. That was great. <laughs> I was just like, who is this guy? What's up with him? And then it was a few seasons into it that, of course, you know, the fight with All Might and all that, you really started to get into it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And I really started to, you know, get into this guy. And then, oh, you know, then he goes to jail, to prison. And I'm like, oh, well, that's a bummer. But I was thinking, you know, he's too big a villain to just end his thing in prison. Again, I had not read the manga. I didn't know anything about it. And the way that we're doing shows now a lot of the time is, is we release it 
pretty quick after the Japanese version comes out as to thwart piracy. So we don't have, oh yeah, remember that show from two years ago, we're dubbing it, and you can watch the whole thing in Japanese with, uh, you know, um, subtitles and, and get the gist of it and all. So we weren't able to do that. So I didn't really ever know what was coming up with All For One as far as, uh, you know, where it was going. But I knew in my heart that there is no way this guy's going to end like this. And so I was like, this is years ago I was thinking this. And then slowly but surely, uh, people would come up to me and go, have you read the manga? I'm like, no. They go, oh man, wait till you see what's about to happen. <laughs> now the manga is always about a year or so in front of the anime. I mean, it takes a while to animate it, obviously. But they started telling me, it's like, yeah, so you're going to break out of prison and you're going to do this. And I was like, I knew it. Yes. <laughs> so um, that was uh, that was really cool. But I, I'm, you know, I'm just excited to see what's where he's going. I'll tell you a little side story. Um, so during the pandemic, um, Funimation put together an online convention. And they invited, you know, viewers from all over the world. You could tune in and stuff. And one of the things that they wanted to do was have me, as All For One, battle All Might, played by Chris Sabat, in the game. <laughs> and they would, you know, you could watch it live. Like, I would sit there and play, and I had a camera on me, and I'm, like, trying to fight All Might. <laughs> Well, I am not a gamer at all. <laughs> I mean, like, the bottle cap on this bottle's a better gamer than me. <laughs> so I told him, I said, listen, I've got an idea though, because I don't want it, I want it to be interesting. I don't want it to be like, oh, yo, pfft, all right, I'm dead. You know, that's, thanks for tuning in, everyone. So I said, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're gonna position the camera so it gets me from about here up. And I'm looking at the TV in my house. My son <laughs> is gonna sit below me with the actual controller that's plugged in. <laughs> and I've got a headset on, and I'm gonna be going, take this all night, you know, and my son's like, pow, 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 you know. <laughs> but my son did not have on a headset, so he couldn't hear what I was hearing. And, um, it, you know, so we were trying to communicate. Also, we were using Wi-Fi, and for some reason our, our signal wasn't super strong. So my son kept going, go, man! And I was like, shh! You know, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so we fight. Well, I win the first battle, or my son does. Then Chris, a.k.a. All Might, wins the second battle. Then it comes down to the third one, and it's like, Think you got this, man? You think you can do this? It's like, no, man, this controller is a little shaky. It's iffy. I'm going to try that. And we're going at it. We get a little ahead, and then Chris comes back and just slaughters us. <laughs> and my son is like, this stupid controller. I'm like, you <laughs> But then I was like, okay, fair enough. You know what? I'm going to come clean everybody. Um, as it turns out, all for one never really has to fight his own battles. I use one of my minions to do my bidding. <laughs> so Josh stood up and he took a bow and everyone's laughing and clapping and all this stuff. So, uh, but Chris had, had beaten us, you know. Well, as it turns out, I found this out about a year later that Chris also wasn't playing the game. <laughs> his 10-year-old daughter was playing the game. <laughs> And she slayed us. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, my son is just, he's a, well, it was a stupid controller. I'm like, no, it was the 10 year old girl. <laughs> uh, own it. That's right. My son is, he's a great kid. He's 19, going to Texas A&M, Galveston, studying marine biology. Our bucket list, number one on the bucket list is one day, he and I will both swim with a great white shark. 
We'll be in a cage, just to clarify. <laughs> outside of the cage, we'll be in the cage. Um, but uh, he's he loves anime, and uh, he's a big you know big big supporter of it. One time, I walked into his room, and uh, I was like, "What are you doing?" He's like, uh, he was on his phone. He goes, ah, "I'm watching some anime." I said, "Really? What are you watching?" He's like, "Soul Eater." I said, "Oh, well, you know your old man plays Lord Death," and he goes. Yeah, I'm watching the Japanese version. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> like, yeah, this is my room. Get out of my house. <laughs> Conversely, my youngest daughter, Tara, who's now 16 and driving, which is why I'm drinking a lot. Uh, <laughs> This is about six years ago, and we had gone to see a movie that I had done called The Boy and the Beast. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. It is a movie by Momura Osada. It's a beautiful movie. It's kind of like Karate Kid meets Jungle Book. Um, it's a really beautiful story. Um, I play the beast. Lucy Christian plays the boy. When the boy grows up, kind of like Hakuna Matata, it's taken over by Eric Vale. It's just a beautiful, beautiful story. One time we went to go see the movie, it, it was actually playing, it had a small theatrical run, and we went to the movies, and there was a crowd about this big in it, and uh, we finished the movie, and everyone's crying and laughing and applauding and everything, and as we're all walking out the back doors of the theater, my daughter, about 10, year, 10 years old at the time, holding my hand, and she looks up to me, and she goes, Daddy, you were awesome as the voice of the beast, and everyone goes, what? You're Chop Swayze? And everyone just like freaks out and crowds around. They're like, oh my gosh, we love the movie. We love you so much. We come and get your autograph. They're just fawning all over me. And I'm just like, oh, this is so much fun. And I turned to my son. I was like, <laughs> watching the Japanese. Are you? <laughs> so, uh, anyway. But uh, anybody else have a question? That, by the way, also is. One of my most favorite, favorite and cherished roles is the the Beast. So. What's up with movie? Yes, thank you. It is a good movie. It is a good movie. It's one of those movies where you're like, gosh, I wish there was a sequel. I'm like, no, 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 no I don't. It's impossible. <laughs> Could be a prequel, but not a sequel. So, does anybody else have a question? Yes. I uh, just wanted to say you brought back two of my favorite childhood animes. Um, you did uh, Gas Back and Trigun Badland Rumble. Oh, yeah! You just uh, recently did Gendo in the Rebuild series for Evangelion. Yes, Gendo for me. Yes, Gendo Ikari, a, a terrific dad. Um, <laughs> just a swell fella. Uh, yeah, we did, uh, that was a lot of fun. That was a company out of actually um, California. I recorded in Texas, but we did the remote recording. But it was, it, was a, it was a lot of fun working with those guys and, and you know, not only revisiting that role and, and kind of redoing it, um, but then seeing how they made the fourth movie and how it ended and all that was, was really something. Have you watched the Netflix version at all? I have not. I have all the originals I wanted to stay through and then I watched yours and you, you did an amazing job. You know? Well, thank you. So in the original, in the original Evangelion, the uh, uh, Gendo was played by a guy named Tristan McCaffrey. And he did like the first season or the first whatever, however many episodes. And then he just like disappeared off the face of the earth, just left, walked away from everything. So I took over the role and then I did the rest of the seasons and I did the movies once when Funimation owned them and I did everything. And then Netflix got a hold of it and they did their own version, but they recast everybody. There's not one original cast member in the, the Netflix versions. And then uh, Amazon came out and redid the movies and that's with the original cast. So it's like, I'm not Gendo, I'm Gendo, I'm not Gendo, and I'm Gendo again. <laughs> so. Did you find yourself doing like the, uh, the fingers and stuff like that when you're doing this role at all? Or? Oh, all the time. <laughs> yeah, he was, he's a fun guy, fun guy. So anybody else have a question? Yep, we'll get you and then we'll get you. Yes. What's your favorite one? My favorite one piece crocodile line. Uh, golly. Enough! Now die. 
or something to that effect. I didn't mean that to you, by the way. That was just mine. <laughs> Clarify. Yeah. Good question. Do I have a character I don't like? Um, like, like I have it morally rehent. You know, he's just—it's so despicable, or just like I hated doing it because. <laughs> you don't know me very well, sorry. Uh, um, I have not really done, I don't know, I don't have a character that I don't like, um, because as an actor, it's just a character, so... And, and, and nobody has even uh, done things, I've never played a character that has gone so far away from what my belief system is or my morale system or anything like that. Because to me, it's just acting, you know? And there are people out there that are that bad. And if you're going to show them and represent them in order to show the good side win or whatever, you've got to have them. So it's nothing like that. Um, I do, I will say, when I've done a couple of, uh, there's one in particular, well, two <laughs> uh, scenes where I've had to, and I couldn't even tell you the name of the shows, but uh, they, were, they weren't even named characters. If they were, they were very small. Um, where I had to have a, they're not hentai, but they had some sort of sexual thing going on with it. And I, and I had to respond, if you will, and enjoy or whatever the heck it is, whatever you want to say. Those are always weird, especially because we can't help but laugh, you know? So, I mean, if you're in there and you're like going, oh, it's like, oh man, no, this is stupid, I can't do it. <laughs> and I just go, ah, like that, or something, anything. You know? But uh, there was a, like I said, my daughter is uh, an actor and she's just mega talented. And uh, she was in the studio one day working with a friend of mine, director named Kyle Jones. And they were working on a show and, and he said, now in this scene, uh, you're, uh, you, there's like a makeout session with your character and kind of a seduction thing. And, you know, it's not very long, but I just, you know, want to give you fair warning just as a, the intimacy level that it's going to hit. And she was like, okay, that's fine. And they're going through the scene, and they were watching it first so she could get an idea of what to do, you know, kind of preview it first. And she's watching it, and she's watching it, and she's kind of clocking along with it. And all of a sudden, she's like, why do I know that voice? Who's this guy? She's like, oh, no! It was me. <laughs> I did not know this was happening. <laughs> Kyle Jones, as a prank on both of us, had my daughter make out with my character. <laughs> so, I think we're done with questions. Uh, that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you a, uh, a question about directing. Uh, being that you uh, are more. Uh, directing uh, these days. Uh, as a director, what tips do you have for voice actors? What do you look for when you're casting someone into a voice acting role? And just, you know, can you tell us anything about that? Sure, sure. Uh, so it's, having moved over to the directing side, uh, having been an actor first, uh, Kyle Jones is a good friend of mine, even though he had me make out with my daughter. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he comes from a writing standpoint, I come from an acting standpoint, but we're both directors. And it's two different viewpoints that, thank you for coming. Uh, it's two different viewpoints of, of the directing style. Plus, we, everyone has their own style of doing things. Um, you know, when I'm casting, the most important thing I look for is your acting ability. It's not, what does your voice sound like? Um, there are some actors who have a very, very distinguished voice, like a uh, Holly Segura or a Brittany Karbowski or a Greg Ayers. You know, they just, they have that voice that that's what they sound like. But they're terrific actors. And they can, you know, so they, it's really with any kind of voice acting, the key 
is making the lines you're saying sound like they're coming from here. They're authentic, they're real, they're coming from your heart. You're not just reciting something uh, that's on a page. And it's not about, I can do a silly voice. Well, that's, can you do a silly voice and, and sound real? That's the main thing. Like there's an old uh, adage from Mel Blanc and somebody came up to him and said, you know, Mr. Blank, I can do a great Daffy Duck and proceeded to do it, and, you know, made a fool of himself. But Blank being the gentleman that he was, he said, well, that's terrific. But what I really want to know is, can you do Daffy Duck reciting Shakespeare and make it work? And that's, you know, that's the essence of voice acting is it's the acting part, not the voice of anybody's ever interested in voice acting. The most important thing you could ever do is find an acting class, get into an acting class. And, and work on that skill first. Because we have the voice. Everyone in here has a voice. Your voice in voice acting is like learning to play a musical instrument, like a guitar. So you can go to the guitar store, the music store, and buy a $5,000 Fender Stratocaster and a $2,000 Marshall amp stack and pedals and switches and all kinds of stuff get it home, plug it all in, set it up, turn it on, but you don't know how to play it. So it really doesn't do you any good. So uh, when people go, man, I want to be a voice actor. I'm getting a new, this microphone. I spent a thousand dollars, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting in my room and things like, well, that's all fine and good. But if you don't know how to act, that's all pointless because it's not going to, no matter what you do, it ain't going to sound good. So the, the biggest point I could give anybody is if you're trying to become a voice actor is, is learn the act, the skill of acting, you know, and, it, and it's a skill. It's not a, I mean, some people can take to it a lot faster than others, but it's a, it's a skill. Anyone can do it. Um, the question is, you know, how good you are, and, uh, you know, what you're going to do with it. You know, that's the other thing about acting is there's a role out there for everyone. You know, the question is you just got to find it. That's the, that's the tricky part. So. Good question, though, Larry. Thank you. Yeah? I'm sorry. I, I know you were more massive. If you can just take it off, just I can't understand. That's okay. Can they just see the 80s? Is there any major changes in technology or style? Is there a bigger. What's changed since you started? Oh, the technology. Oh, that's very good on that. So back in the old days, not the old days. <laughs> we use stone tablets and chisels. Uh, we it's called pancake reels, and they're big reels of tape. And you had a beep system, and you spin the tape, you watch the video, and it would go beep beep beep. On that fourth silent beep is when you would start talking, and it was lined up with time code and everything, so then they could take that tape and it would match perfectly on the the reel that was up here with the movie. Nowadays, everything's digitized, it's all digital. So you use Pro Tools or Audacity or, or a GarageBand or anything. It doesn't matter when you start it. So in Houston, we don't use the beep system. We just, we, a lot of people call it the chase method. But what we do is like, you're gonna have a line and it's gonna come in, we'll, we'll say record. The video backs up three seconds and it gives you a three second pre-roll. And you look at the time code, and you go, one, two, three, four. all right then, let's go before it's too late. And then we take that line, and we slide it over, slide the digital file over to where the video starts, and then we just make it fit. And if it's too short, we say slow it down, or we add words. If it's too long, we say speed it up, or we take out words. But yeah, it has made, I mean, and I, I started this in 87 and, and we were, they were already using the digitized version at ADV. I would still do commercials and stuff where they were still spin and tape. But at ADV, they've always, as long as I've been there since 87, not, excuse me, not 87, 97. Yeah, 97. Uh, they've always used the tape, the digitized version. But even now, like it's got, you know, the, the Pro Tools and the systems have gotten faster and better. There's one little, <clears throat> thing that and we all have there's no way around it um, when we talk we, we have little clicks in our mouth you know our that kind of thing and even if it's very subtle but we try to make sure those are gone you don't want to listen to that but now there's a program on app 
that you can put in Pro Tools, and it's a de-clicker. And you just highlight what you want, hit a button, and it takes out, instead of going through and manually removing the clicks, it just takes them out for you. You know, there's, so the technology has uh, really come a long way. The one thing that, you know, people ask me, are, are you afraid of AI? Is, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and automated voices is, um, I don't think, even though I know it exists, I don't think I'll see it as a replacement for what actors do, at least not in my lifetime. But uh, it is something that is really weird when you, you know, if you just type in the words and the voice just says it, you know, but whether or not you can get the emotion or you can get the actual proper timing down, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they will eventually, but for now, my, I think my job is safe. But technology has been a, a huge game changer, especially also in the world of remote recording. So uh, it's, it's really cool. So like, if I were here five years ago and somebody says, I want to get in, I live here in Lancaster, PA, I want to do anime dubbing. I'd have to say, well, you need to either move to Dallas or Houston or LA or, or Vancouver, because those are the towns it's done in. Now, you can live in Lancaster and work for the studios in Vancouver, LA, Dallas, and Houston if you have a home studio set up. So that that aspect of technology has uh, has been great. It's really cool and it makes things a lot tougher too. It's really cool because if you live here and you want to do this, you can do it from here. What's not cool about it is everyone else that lives here that wants to do it can also do it from here. So instead of going, yeah, there's this great guy up in Pennsylvania I'm gonna use, I've got, not only do I have a hundred of you up here, I've got hundreds actually in Houston now. You know what I mean? The, the market, the pool of actors has grown exponentially um, in this genre. Uh, and I will say, that's because of people like you, the fans, and how awesome you are, um, and how you all have helped make this whole world we live in called anime hugely and wildly popular. And it's still, I think, on a very meteoric rise in popularity. So I remember when I started, like I said earlier, when I started doing these, there might be one or two a month. Now there's six and seven a week of all varying sizes, from 500 people to 50,000 people at a show. And it's, it's ginormous. And part of the thing is, I think that it's because um, the worlds have collided of MCU, Star Wars, anime, I mean, basically sci-fi. All of those things have come into, you know, play gaming. And it's just, it's like the nerds all finally got together and said, yes, we can do this. And so we're, we're just like, because when you walk around, you're going to see Toga from... Uh, uh, all my hero academia, but you walk outside the door, you very well can see Darth Vader or Spider Man. You know, so um, it's it's really cool how this has grown. The other thing too, and I'm getting a little off topic about what you asked about the the technology, but one of the things that I really love about anime conventions and the anime community is um, it's it's just a very accepting and loving community. You know. I mean, we all want to be with our own tribe. And I'm I'm a big jam band. I love jam bands, but especially the Grateful Dead, the Big Deadhead. And one of the reasons I love it so much is because when you go there, everyone there is for one reason, to watch this band and have an amazing experience. While you're not necessarily here to watch a band, you are here to have an amazing experience and be with your friends, lift each other up, love each other, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's one of the things I just I just love about coming to shows like this um, is is that aspect of it. So, frankly, I, I think that the world can take a lesson on how to get along uh, by attending an anime convention. <laughs> you know, it's not hard. Just love each other. It's simple. So, anyway, uh, we got time for a couple more questions. Anybody else got a thought or a question they want to share? Yeah. Last question. What's my favorite anime? Start with Raw. Kogoro, yes! <laughs> um, any old ones? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I really wish they would bring back Soul Eater. 
Um, I, I would just, I would love that so much. So, Soul Leader and uh, my, no, not my hair. Soul Leader and Full Metal Alchemist to me are like, they're like gateway animes. You know what I mean? Like if marijuana is the gateway drug, those are the gateway animes. <laughs> they will get you hooked into this genre. Um, so I do wish that. I love doing Sergeant Frog. That was a blast. Uh, we had a, and it was funny too. And I, I don't know if you were in here for this, but I was talking about licensing. Uh, ADV Films had Sergeant Frog originally, and I directed. We it, we were trying to make it our a really huge uh, marquee show for us. I directed a version. Somebody else in the company directed a version, and all this stuff. And then there was this big implosion in the company, and we lost everything. And then. Funimation acquired a bunch of our titles and they did a Sergeant Frog. So I've played several of the frogs, but I've also, but th none of that was ever released. So, but I also played Kokoro in the Funimation version. So if you haven't seen Sergeant Frog, it's about space alien frogs. And I played Kokoro, who looks like a 1970s space ranger. Uh, and his, even his animation was just kooky and choppy. But all the lines, he did everything like this. Ha ha ha! I am Kogoro, here to arrest you. <laughs> and uh, Joel uh, McDonald, who was the director at Funimation, who's now the director at Gearbox, who, where we did uh, Borderlands 2 and 3, um, he would say literally, like, you know what, John? Because sometimes when you're reading the script, your eyes will play tricks and you'll flip words and all this stuff. And you, you gotta go back and fix that. But for Kogoro, he would just say, read the line and see what it's saying, and then say it however you want. <laughs> but like Kogoro would do it. So it would be, it's just, it was almost like non secular, like, ha ha ha, Kogoro has come now to take you there. You know, and just, chew. <laughs> and you know, just bizarre, non secular stuff. But he was a lot of fun. I love that. Yeah. Um. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, Von Hohenheim line? Why did you burn down my house? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love that. In the very back, yeah. Hello. Hello. What was your favorite line as Salvador in Borderlands? So, you'll have to come to the 18 uh, over <laughs> panel tomorrow night, Con Horror Stories, to hear that. Or come by my table at autographs and I will share it with you, but it is a rather blue line and I, I don't want to risk, uh, uh, ins not insulting, but just, you know, upsetting anyone because it, it's kind of, kind of vulgar. Do you have any TV ones? Do I have any what? Do you have any TV ones? From Salvador? Yeah, no, it's a hard question. That's a real tough one for him. I mean, everything, he <laughs> suck it! That's about it, so. <laughs> So, um, I was going to put Bob out there, and I realized that you are doing voice of Lucy's dad, um, um, in, um, in Shin-Chan. In, in what? Um, um, that would be, um, in Shin-Chan. Oh, Shin-Chan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this is probably going to be an 18 and over here, too, but you're going to appear behind him. Man, I, I don't. I'm sure I did. I, that's been, a, that's a long time ago. Uh, that was a fun show. That I remember that. That was a really fun show to record. That's one of those shows like Ghost Stories kind of where, um, where it's just like there was liberty to kind of change things up and say things like you wanted to, you know. I, I would also encourage you, uh, I made this announcement at opening ceremonies, but tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, in what room are we in, Larry, for the movie? Uh, we look at it real quick. Well, anyway, tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, I'm showing a movie it's a live action movie called Lake, well, the original was called uh, Gamera 2, Attack of the Legion. Uh, we renamed it Lake Texarkana Gamera. Right here. <laughs> in here, right it'll be here. tomorrow night in here at 8 o'clock. But we dubbed the entire movie as a bunch of Texas rednecks. <laughs> and uh, you'll hear lines like, well, that's a big ass turtle. <laughs> so come by and check that out, but uh, we have a lot of fun with that. Is that more like a mystery <laughs> science theater kind of? It's a kind of a mystery science theater. I mean, we're not commenting on it, but we're, it's, and we just, we just changed the lines. We left the, the main actress 
in the real voice to kind of carry the storyline. And then we changed all the characters around her. And then we gave it a, a, a backdrop subplot of the grand opening of Uncle Stubby's Liquor, after liquor Ammo, and Tackle. And uh, it's it, it just, you know, it's hilarity in, ensues. So come check it out. Yeah. I mean, one of the visiting Japan that was in some service to do with anime, did you get any uh, interest in the history and culture of that country? I, I would love to go to Japan. Um, a lot of my uh, colleagues have been, uh, a lot of friends of mine, Dave Matranga, and, uh, Emily Neves, and uh, Andrew Love, and they all went over there to do a lot of mocap stuff uh, for some shows we were doing, um, Appleseed, and stuff like that. Um, I have never been, but man, I would love to go. Absolutely love to go. That's, that is number two on my bucket list. In fact, if I could go to Japan, and swim with a great white shark, <laughs> I'd be in heaven, but I think that's highly unlikely. But I would love, absolutely love to go. Have you ever been? No, I'm, like I said, I'm looking forward to going some point. So I heard it's a good time, like, uh, it's relatively cheap conversion rate to the US to the end right now, so I'm looking forward to Yeah, I would, I would love to go. In fact, you know, I, if I weren't, Traveling every weekend, doing conventions, maybe I can find time. But um, I, I just, I do need to make time to do it because I think it would be an amazing adventure. Uh, one of our engineers just got back, and he just, you know, God, he's just had a, a, a time of his life, you know. And I, I just want to go back and see, you know, or not go back and see, but go and see. Just, you know, when you go to any place, everything's done a little differently. And when we're on our own little siloed cocoon of life, you know, where you get used to, this is how things are. And when you step out of that, even coming from like Houston to Lancaster, you know, we went out last night and uh, I got in kind of late. And Larry's like, you want to get dinner? And I was like, I would love to. And he goes, well, I got one place that's open right now. And we got there and they weren't open. They were already closed. So it was very foreign to me to kind of look around and go, you know, it's only like 11 o'clock. Why is everything <laughs> shut down? I don't, I can't compute. I don't get it. But it is what it is. So I'm, I'm yeah, one day. Friend me on Facebook and then you'll know when I go. Okay. Is Facebook even a thing? I don't know. I mean, it's like, you know, I gave somebody my email address and they go, oh, I haven't seen that address in a while. <laughs> well, it wasn't CompuServe or anything. So it was, you know, I feel like I'm falling behind. But don't worry, you're in the perfect age group for Facebook. <laughs> I'm sure there's a compliment in there somewhere. <laughs> One time I was talking to my son and I said, you know what? I'm just, there needs to be a term for somebody who has just had enough technology. Like, I don't care what comes out next, I'm done. I've hit my point where that's all I need to be able to do. I don't need it to do this and this and this. And my son goes, oh, there is a term for that. He said, really, what is it? He went, boomer. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> no, uh, but, it, but, it, but it's true. But I mean, even, even for you, I mean, I'm sure, you know, one day you're gonna reach a point and go, I don't need to teletransport. I just don't need it. I don't want to do that. While other people are going, look at me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Boomer's fine. I've, I've, I've embraced it. I'm the last one. I am the, technically, I was born in 64. So, Boomer, that's the last year of the Boomer. My mom was born in that year. Your mom was born in that year? Yeah. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, anyway, did you have a question in the back? I thought I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Oh, my favorite Lord Deathline, uh, not free up, something like that. I, I, again, that was such a long time ago, and you know, it's hard for me to remember, but I just, uh, I just love doing that character. Mainly as a voice actor, I love doing that character because he had a mask on the whole time. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't limited to the mouth flaps. I could do it. I had a lot more freedom as an actor. Um, and he was just such a fun character, you know? And then, uh, I also love the fact when he got really mad, his voice went way down low. That was a lot of fun to, to be able to do both those voices. So. Uh, all right, guys, got time for like one more question or one or two? Yeah. Uh, 
So a few months ago, I was at an anime convention where Kent Williams was asked about roles that got away from him. They wish he had gotten. And he said, yes, every role that John Swayze has gotten. <laughs> so I was wondering, really? is, is that a two-way street where there are roles that got away from you? Where you that no, they... but I can tell you my favorite roles are the ones where I beat Kent Williams out of <laughs> <laughs> Now, Kent, Kent Williams is a darling. I love him. He's a wonderful man. And uh, we've worked together before. And he's, he's, he's fantastic. That's very kind of him to say that. Um, as far as roles that I wish I'd got, yeah, there's a couple of them. Um, but I don't like, it's a tricky question too, because, you know, like, um, sometimes you'll like audition for a role and you don't get it. And then when you hear the person that got it, you're like, not that oh, I did way better than that. But it's all, it's sometimes it's like, that was good, but that kind of sounded like what I did. <laughs> you know, not that they stole it or anything like that. I don't mean that. I'm just saying that, you know, this, this game of, of casting and, and auditioning, I mean, there's so many reasons why you don't get it. You just have to like go, ah, I didn't get it, I'll move on. Um, one of them I was going for was, uh, even though I played, uh, I played Dodoria, which is one of Frieza's um, henchmen in Dragon Ball. Um, when Chris Ayers was no longer able to do Frieza, and Chris is a very good friend of mine, um, I auditioned for it and, and really wanted it. I mean, I wanted to get it. I think Damian Mills does a fantastic job. I think Linda Young did a great job. I think Chris Ayers did a great job. And not that I could have done any better and that, that's not my point. My point was it's just such a cool and iconic role that it would have been cool to do it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I also think that, you know, people ask you a lot of times, are you afraid of being typecast and stuff like that? And you have to remember as an actor, uh, no, we're not afraid of being typecast. We're afraid of being not cast. So, you know what, if I'm relegated to playing dads and villains, I'm going to kick ass with that, you know what I mean? Because that's that's what I'm really good at. I feel, you know, like I can really do well. So, um, and I, you know, again, and, and nothing, and it's very sweet of Kent to say that, uh, but I, you know, people have beat, beaten me out of roles and I've beaten other people out of roles. When I go to auditions, uh, it's not so much for uh, this anymore, because most of the time they just email you an audition, you can do it from home. but going to commercial and film auditions in person back, and this is actually all pre-pandemic, pre but where there's like 20 people in the room and we're all sitting there waiting for our turn to go in there. And we all know each other. We're all friends, you know. But people would come up, they want to talk, and you know, what have you been up to? And blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, I would love to chat with you, but I'm here to beat you out of a job. <laughs> so I'll talk to you later. <laughs> right before you want to go in, but I'm next, so I got to focus on me, you know. So uh, that's the tough thing about being an actor sometimes. It's not, number one, you don't get any, you don't get everything you audition for. Number two is you very well could be beating out some of your best friends to get it, you know, and it's, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow on both ends sometimes. But anyway, guys, that is all the time we have, but I want to just say thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for having me. This is wonderful. I'll be at my table tonight at 6, 6.30? Uh, 6 is VIP, 8 o'clock is the regular. Okay, come by, get an autograph, say hello, and we'll uh, let's have a great weekend. Thank you. Yeah, come see Texarkana tomorrow at 8 o'clock. If anybody didn't get a sticker and wants one, come on up. Stickers, I want stickers. I want stickers. Did you want stickers? Oh, wait, I have a Sticker. Got it, yeah. I read, um, you want to do a part nine yet? Did you read part nine yet? Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought he would, you know, change or get a different name, you know. Yuri and Yor, would you mind if I got a photo of the two yeah, of you? Sure. Feel free to swap Once you get your sticker again. Yeah.
Anything else? Uh, yeah, real quick. Can we just do one more? Sure, sure. Actually, you guys just want to do a quick rooftop of everybody because we don't have time to do like individual shots. We got to get out of here. There's, there's people coming in. This, this is not a photo session, guys. But if yeah. anyone wants to get in, everyone get in or no one gets in. Yeah. Awesome. You can share with everybody? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we got to clear up for the next one. I don't, I don't, I don't want to disrespect the next folks. Absolutely. Hold on. Pretty good. I can't wait. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So don't swear around it? Yeah. Please don't swear. Don't mess our partners that So here's the power button. Okay. So if you press and hold that, uh, the light will Oh, I see it push. Yeah, yeah. You'll see the, the lights eventually count down. And now it's off.